We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 145 of the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And what we're going to be looking at in this session is the troubles and triumphs in the therapy room. Yes, what a wonderful podcast title. And I think I should write a book on that. Yes, that what a wonderful title that would be. Yeah, yeah. Problems and triumphs. In fact, I... I've got the site, my first, well, a book, there's three books in my head. One is the Psychotherapy Cookbook, which I still, I meant to start oh, on Christmas, I haven't got around to the podcast one also. But and this, the title of this one's Problems and Triumphs in the Psychotherapy Room sounds fantastic. Do you know something? Um, I think there's a tendency, I don't think it's just me. But it took me a long time to uh, move to celebrating my triumphs. Yeah. Much more likely to focus on all the troubles I have. I don't have the same with all psychotherapists. I get that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I didn't, and, and, you know, after all my years and wisdoms, I hope now, I often say to people, especially the people I supervise, how often do you celebrate your victories with clients? And unfortunately, a lot of them say, what, what are you talking about? Or some sort of phrase and tend to dismiss that process. But unless we do that, I think we don't feed our soul. Yeah, I suppose for me, I don't see them as my triumphs. What do you see them as that? Their triumphs. <laughs> <laughs> you don't see them as the collective process. No. Even. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I understand completely what you're saying about filling you your own soul and filling your own bucket up and everything. And yeah, but there is that kind of narcissistic look at me type of thing connected with it somehow. Well, well I, 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 I think it was on the previous podcast I talked about a client that got into contact with me after 10 years. And uh, she'd written a lot of what happened in the therapy process and she was talking about how it, how it, the therapy had changed her life and this, that, the other. No, not only was I very moved, but I also thought, well, I didn't really celebrate at the time what we'd achieved together. Yeah. And I felt a professional satisfaction. I allowed myself, even though it was 10 years after the event, to allow myself <laughs> a satisfaction that I perhaps didn't allow myself to have all those years ago. Yeah. And that's good. We should we should allow ourselves that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's certainly because we can't we can't break confidentiality. We can't talk about what happens inside the therapy room mm. outside. So it's not like you do a good day, you know, a good thing at work and you go home and you talk to your missus or your husband about it and say, Oh, I did a fantastic thing today in work, because you can't talk about it. No. That's true. And when she wrote up some of the therapy in her, and the, so I, I was reading some of the therapy that I did, and I thought, gosh, did I do that? That was what I didn't quite say that was wonderful, but the professional satisfaction I got, and also, but I think it's personal and professional together, and, and how the therapy, and the, of course, she did it, I know, but I witnessed the journey and helped a little bit. Um, she, changed her life around yeah i don't think i took enough professional satisfaction at the time i allowed it 10 years later which is a great shame now i'm talking about. <laughs> i didn't celebrate if you like or i didn't really allow the professional satisfaction earlier on it's a very um, privileged job that we have that's very true to, and, to uh, see you know what we see inside the therapy room and and to witness the transformations that we potentially see in each and every client it's it's an honor and a privilege absolutely mm. i think with triumphs it's a we could use a lot of other words but 
for me, a, a triumph can, is usually around not not the sort of technical way, particularly of a client, you know, achieving their contractual goals. But it's usually it is around that, but it's usually around transformation, mm. around when somebody really makes that transfer transformational process in their lives and they turn their lives around or whatever we want to put it that's a triumph it's a collective triumph yes that's probably a better way of looking at it yeah uh, but i certainly don't want to minimize my part in the collective triumph and i think i did a lot of minimizing the parts i played in the collective triumph of transformation yeah uh, i think i still do do you know what i mean but i, I think it's the it's the little things that happen that totally transform a client's life you know when they they've not been able to do something and then suddenly they they do it and it, it's a massive impact for them yeah yeah i mean there's times at the end of therapy but what I never allowed myself to do much, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about as I talk to you, is the triumphs as we go along. Mm. You know, just even from the beginning where you know, your, your kind attitude or whichever way you want to look at it has such an impact on the client. And they say, well, I've never had any eyes brought up on crumbs rather than having a full meal. Yeah. Just just in a way of that sense of healthy humanity could be seen as a triumph, or at least could be seen as when the I mean when the when the client actually yeah talks about it in this way could be seen as a, a sort of breakthrough anyway. But um, I could certainly look back now and think of the triumphs of lots of clients I've had and it is all around their healthy movements in life, their yeah. transformational spirit, their sense of courage. Yes. Their, yes. Their sense of staying in therapy. Their sense of taking the steps to trust me so we could do the therapy. Yeah. That's, well that's a big thing. It, it is a big thing for them to trust us in the process mm. you know for me i think that most of my triumphs have been around you know something about giving them permission to just be who they want to be and not feeling like they need to conform to anything and mm. you, you know what i mean having a safe space and holding them for them to to practice and to try new things and then to come back and tell you about it mm -hmm to come back and tell you about it yeah 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 and when you see the the actual look in their eye and the look on the face when they have actually achieved something that they wanted to do that they never thought they could you, you can't if you could bottle that it'd be worth a fortune mm. so is that what you see mainly is what would indicate a clinical triumph yes yeah even something simple as I can remember, you know, quite recently I've asked a client, you know, what do they want? What do you want to happen? And, you know, it stopped them in the tracks and it's like, I've never been asked that before. Mm. I don't actually know what I want. Mm. You know, and for them to have a space where they can work out what it is that they want to do. Yeah, and... Those moments are very humbling, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking of another client who also got in touch with me, and she she was very important that I know how much or the part I played in her transformation. And the most important thing was seemed for her that I helped create a safe space for her to mm -hmm. talk about her journey. Yeah. How how you do how you do that is perhaps another podcast, but um, 
I feel humbled myself when someone gives me that feedback. Yes. On, on another level, completely, I, I think. I think when I think of triumphs, uh, it's usually really there's many ways I can look at it, but actually, people staying with me in the therapy journey and not running away and not mm. leaving and or whatever is a is a personal and professional triumph that they trusted me to actually stay in the process. Yeah. Is a triumph um, when things get tough they don't run yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely um, um, but i don't think back and think of that i can think of some clients where i can say oh that's such a success that that's such a triumph but on a very different level for all the clients that in the many many years of psychotherapy that i've done who've stayed the distance with me are the triumphs i think about i think as well yes That's much more in fact yeah what about the troubles most of the most of the troubles you know jackie are counter transferential yeah so for the people who's listening to me you know i hope they understand what i mean by counter transference most of the troubles have been when I have part of my own past has been activated by their past in some ways yeah, in the psychotherapy process. Most of the problems come from when perhaps I've merged with the client because they identify or the opposite of me. So the major problems, I'm not talking about the administrative problems, I'm not talking about the logistical problems, but the clinical problems are when, are basically to do with, yeah, how can I, when my past collides with their past. Yeah. And we don't know that that's going to happen until it does. <laughs> <laughs> That's the issue. Yeah. You can't see that one coming. <laughs> no, you can you can say so. Well, I haven't done enough therapy in this area, which is usually what I, or I haven't done enough supervision, but it's usually it's therapy. And the therapist, the clients become gifts in a way because they indicate the therapy that I need to do, and all, uh, 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 and I can only thank them for that. However, at the time, the challenge is if we're going to call the, yeah, we're going to call the words problems. Um, is is when my dysfunctional past uh, is activated in the therapeutic process. Yeah. And then I act out in some way, usually, or we both act out in some way. So our adults become less accessible. Yes. Yeah. I think that's the origination of the difficulties I have. Yeah. And you're right. If I could have done the four, five, six, the seven years of therapy I did before I started therapy I think things would have been very helpful yeah. but of course a lot of the therapy I did um, I did as I went along like you know yourself uh, in psychotherapy training you have to be in therapy or what type of therapy we do anyway um, for at least I think it's four years but you know I continued continue as we went along and so some of my own journey of therapy paralleled my clients journeys absolutely i That's joke cool. with my clients i didn't think there was anything wrong with me until i started doing my psychotherapy training and then realized whoa there is quite a lot of stuff there that i need to be looking at yeah absolutely and even now i'm still unearthing things you just get into your adult quicker i think yes yeah, I know when I'm in my script and I know when I'm out of my script and I know what affects me and what doesn't affect me, yeah. And I'm much more aware of... I was very much in my head all the time. I was very much logical. I used to think my way through things, whereas now I'm a lot more comfortable having feelings and not necessarily having to do anything with them, just understanding that it's okay to have feelings. And that took me... 
a long time to come to terms with. Mm. So if you think of it as a therapy profession, it's one of the professions where we learn on the job in a way. Yeah. 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 I think it's the only way that you can do it is to learn on the job. And perhaps the clients should be paying us uh, or perhaps we should be paying the clients. I'm sure there's a few that I should drop the odd, you know, <laughs> couple of quid to or whatever. Definitely. Yeah. So they play us, but perhaps we should also play them. Uh, and hopefully we're just a bit of a bit of psychological time ahead of them. But I think the problems and challenges for me have always occurred in the counter transfers. Yeah. I mean, there might be some logistical problems I've created, some admin problems I've created, or you know, uh, or some things, or even some things which where I don't know where I've taken. I blurred some of the ethic, ethical boundaries in some ways. So, but they're sort of, you could say they come from a therapeutic class, but usually it's when the uh, past or the dysfunctional part of myself gets caught up with the dysfunctional part of the client. That's where problems happen. Yeah. I think the only other things that have happened to me is when the client feels like I've let them down. And it's usually been around what you touched on then about ethics and my stance as a psychotherapist on what's acceptable and what's not, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense completely. Um, yeah, that makes sense. I've had to terminate one and it was in the early days and I can remember taking it to supervision and feeling so uncomfortable, but knowing what I had to do but it went against everything, being a people pleaser and not wanting to upset people. But I had to terminate the contract because he wasn't telling the truth. He was lying. And I didn't see how I could work therapeutically with somebody that wasn't being authentic. And it was the most difficult thing I've ever had to do, I think. <laughs> so that's a, very, that's a very good example of what you just talked about there. Um, other problems, uh, Jackie, when I haven't taken things to supervision quick enough or I haven't used supervision effectively, and what I mean by effectively, usually it's going to supervision quicker than I, you know, sitting on the supervision issue yeah. while dealing with it in supervision. When I haven't done that, problems can occur much quicker. Yes, yeah. And if I had to give a piece of advice to the you know, beginning therapist or even therapist who've been around a while, which I'm sure they know themselves, is use supervision because it's a support mechanism which is really important in our profession. And if I, when I haven't done that, problems have often occurred. Yeah. When I haven't gone to therapy quick enough, when I say quick enough, I haven't dealt with some of the dysfunctional issues which have come up. Uh, or I've, or I've sort of um, defended against what I think I should have worked on, that can lead to problems because it invariably comes up in the therapy process. And then you have challenges to deal with in the clinical setting. So therapy and supervision, the use of it is really important. This is what I talk about all the time in these podcasts, Bob, when I say it's like the matrix. There's so many different things coming. It's our own baggage. It's the client. It's the, you know, the 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 therapeutic pro there's just so much going on in that therapy room oh there's so much and also some i, I don't know if it's problems it does but you know continual cpd i think has been very important for me yeah and if i've got myself up to date in the various areas <clears throat> of different things from neurodiversity to whatever um then those gaps often Funny enough, and it's not funny at all. But then clients appear. Yeah. When, in the very the universe has a wonderful way of doing that to us. Yeah. yeah. And when I first started out, I always would think, oh gosh, I don't know how these clients have got to me because they actually represent all the difficult problems I have in myself. Yeah. Um, so therapy, supervision, CPD, those are all the areas that I uh I did use effectively but perhaps 
at times when I didn't go quick enough, problems often occurred. Yeah. And a lot of them came from a counter transcendental place. Yeah, I think I probably agree with that 100%. Yeah, some of the practicalities, some of the, yeah, the, the you know, that side of things. But the majority of it is when I've been triggered or I've been part of a process. Yeah. You said something very, very true, I think. Is um, when I haven't been aware of my script quick enough, and you said it, you said, well, often we're not aware we're in it. Yeah. That has led me to what I would call defensive psychotherapy, which has then caused problems. Yeah. So I'm not saying it's straightforward to catch hold of our scripts or to be aware of them, but I think that as soon as we can, if we can act on that and be open to our own vulnerability, then some of these difficulties or so-called difficulties or challenges will be diminished. Yeah. And I think hopefully that, you know, the listeners to this podcast will, will take all the positives from this, that even you, Bob, who's been doing this for you know, 40 odd years or whatever it is, none of us are fallible. We're all human beings who have, yeah. we go through the same processes. We all have a script. We all, things happen in our life, whatever it is, that these things happen to all of us. Yeah, and and, and, and if we can get in touch with our own vulnerability. Yeah. And our, our, and our allow ourselves to be vulnerable, then... 100%. I think the worst thing we can do is to think that, you know, we can do all things for all people and we can't. No, that's, that's absolutely right. And if we, go to, if, we, if we go down that road, what you've just said there, uh, well, I think there'll be many problems. Yeah. If we use that language, you know, it'll be a harder clinical road for us. Yeah. And for me, you know, I, th I think it's only been recently over the last two or three years that I've focused an awful lot more of my own personal attention on making sure that I'm the best version of me, you know, practicing a lot more self-care and a lot more self-compassion and all those sort of things, I think, that are making me a much better psychotherapist now rather than just working hard at it. <laughs> yeah. And I, making that, it work. Yeah. That's a, that, I was just going to say a little bit of that, and that is... So, and I, I know we're perhaps centering on problems a little bit more than perhaps trans, but um, just sort of parallel process what we're talking about here. But I do think that unless we can do all the things you just talked about, which is compassion for ourselves and self care, and allow ourselves to you know open our hearts up more, um, then there'll be more challenges in the clinical setting. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I said so in this podcast that if we can allow ourselves to really take on board some of our triumphs and positive clinical feedback from our clients through that transformational process I'm talking about, our soul is more enriched. Yeah. If our soul is more enriched and more likely to have a more open psychotherapy process absolutely the two yeah. people can really meet yes yeah i'm thinking in my training now whether we did anything on self-care and self-compassion and basic taking care of ourselves and i think I, I could be completely wrong here but the only thing i can think that sticks in my mind is that 2080 rule about the you know the type of clients that you have that you don't take on too many Disturbed. you know disturbed clients and that you know obviously you only have so many clients in a week or whatever but the actual practicalities of practicing self-care whatever that is do you know what i mean like i know that you you're adamant and you've done 20 years of retreats you know that should be part of being a therapist is that we we map out time for ourselves to to take care of us I couldn't agree more. And of course, long-term developmental psychotherapists, which which I certainly sort of title myself as, 
means all the things you've just talked about, which is opening up my own heart, centering my own vulnerability, and allowing myself to be compassionate with myself and other people, and all those things, self care and everything else. It took me quite a time to get there, but I uh, agree with you. Yeah. Now, somebody who works in very short term, say six sessions, might say, well, listen to this podcast anyway, all of those things aren't necessary. Uh, however, I think elements of them are. I, I, I can honestly say I don't think there's one client that I've had that hasn't made an impression on me. The good or bad? Absolutely, yeah. Some more than others, but I think each and every one of them has actually made an impression on me. Probably left an imprint on your soul then. Yeah. I know I don't think I'd have it any other way because to me that's that's the connection that's you know what I mean the therapeutic relationship. Mm. That would be a great title of the book. Imprint our uh, imprints on our soul. Yeah. See, you've got so many book titles here, Bob. You need to get cracking with them all. You've got a library. <laughs> so until next time, when what we'll actually be talking about, according to my list, is the importance of observational skills in the therapy room. Well, you know, I'm a real advocate of that. And I believe all TA therapists are advocates of that because they've been taught from the beginning uh, the importance of observational skills with regards to ego states. Yeah. That should be a good podcast. Okie doke until next time, Bob. See you then. Take care. Bye bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.